Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today for Gathering Voices with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. We're so grateful that you're with us on this third Tuesday of July for our special conversation today with Reverend Wes Granberg Michelson. Um, Wes, thank you for joining us today. Um, it's a real privilege and an honor for us to be in conversation with you. My colleague Ariel Gold, our executive director, will be hosting the conversation with you. I'd like to just start out by um, giving a brief bio for Wes, who has had an extraordinarily distinguished career in the field of religion, faith, and ecumenical relations and organizing across the world. Um, right now, uh, you, I believe, are serving as the chair of the board of Sojourners, the leading evangelical uh, movement for peace, justice, nonviolence, and human rights based in Washington, DC. And previously, um, you spent a number of years on the global staff of the World Council of Churches. Uh, and I'm, I expect working from the Geneva headquarters yeah. and um, uh, in the areas of faith and society, working with uh, some of the hundreds and hundreds of denominations and Christian organizations located across the globe, working together through the WCC. And before that, as the uh, General Secretary of the Reformed Church in America, one of the uh, major um, uh, religious Christian denominations in this country. And uh, even before that, on the Hill uh, with Senator uh, Mark Hatfield. So it's uh, really wonderful to, to, for us today to be able to draw on that deep, deep uh, history of your experience in both the public policy sector and uh, the world of religion and public life. And I know that Ariel is excited to join you in conversation, particularly as we deepen our work and commitment in FOR and related movements to reclaiming the name of God against Christian nationalism and hatred. Um, Ariel, um, please join. Thank you so much, Ethan. And thank you so much, Wes, for joining us. I apologize to anybody if there's uh, if you hear any background noise, I'm coming into Washington, D.C. and had a bunch of flight delays. So I'm doing this call from the airport. And just want to let folks know that uh, the reason I'm coming into D.C. is because FOR, um, as well as some other groups, are hosting a, a breakfast tomorrow morning for Dr. Abdel Fattah Abersor. Uh, who is the director of the El Rawad Cultural Arts Society in Ida Refugee Camp in uh, Bethlehem. Um, the first place that I, I saw in occupied Palestine and experienced the tear gassing of children. And so if you are in DC, tomorrow's event is over full, uh, but he's also speaking tonight at five o'clock and I'll be kind of racing there from here at uh, Bus Boys and Poets on 14th and V. So if you're near there and can join, please do. Uh, welcome, Wes, it's, it's wonderful to see you. Well, it's just great to be with you, Ariel. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, for that generous uh, introduction. It's uh, it's great to be interacting this way with FOR. Um, I've had a long and treasured relationship with the Fellowship of Reconciliation, uh, going back even to leaders like Jim Forrest, uh, have so admired uh, the work that you continue to do. And now in this present moment, uh, to be partnered with you is a is a real joy. So thanks so much, Ariel. Thank you. So there's so many things that uh, we could talk, I could talk with you about, including uh, your experiences with FOR and the history of FOR. But what I really invited you here today to talk about is white uh, Christian nationalism. Uh, we at FOR, we're, we're building a campaign called Reclaim the Name, Reclaim the Name of God for those who would uh, distort, and pervert uh, our faith for purposes of hatred and violence, and and, and you're really a, an expert on this. So you, you, you've described religion as being used intentionally and in very damaging ways as part of the political landscape and rhetoric in our modern era. Could you give some examples and um, speak a bit on that? 
Well, I think one of the most distressing things today, Ariel, is how uh, religious impulses and convictions have been so complicit and so completely captured by political forces and ideology and amongst them, particularly white Christian nationalism. Um, there's always been a tension between uh, how the gospel from the Christian tradition relates to the political sphere. Um, and there's always been a, a long history of politics trying to co-opt uh, the power and the, wiz and the witness and the sanction of the church for purely political gains. But what we see happening now, I think, is, uh, is more dastardly and more dangerous because faith, in at least my tradition, the Christian tradition, is getting redefined in ways that are so antithetical to the message of the gospel. Um, and that's what we particularly see in the movement of white Christian nationalism um, and the way it's been reinforced, of course, by the political trends that have led to the ascendancy within Republican politics of Donald Trump. Um, but the danger, the danger is that uh, faith itself uh, takes on a, a, a heretical definition and public focus. Um, you've seen this at other points in history, but to see it now within U.S. history, um, where people claim that it's the ideology and the hope of white Christian nationalism that somehow defines the message of Jesus and claims their allegiance as followers of Christ um, strikes to the heart of our witness in society. Um, the, the term evangelical has now lost all theological meaning and is purely a political and cultural term. And increasingly, that's what I fear about the term Christian itself. That in the public consciousness now, Christian means sort of the association with those who have this particular agenda that is so that is so antithetical to what uh, the message of our faith's founder was about. Um, so that's why I am particularly concerned at this point, Ariel. Uh, not not just about the political and ideological impact of of white Christian nationalism, but about what it's doing to the message of my own faith tradition. As uh, somebody of the Jewish faith tradition with our faith co-opted for purposes of oppression um, and violence, I can certainly relate to that concern and the necessity to take back um, ownership of our, of our faith my right. colleague, uh, Reverend Graylin Hagler, uh, he has asked that we as a team put Christian in quotes because of, of the need to take back uh, what Christianity is from how it has become. I think you said it so perfectly um, that, that that's become co-opted where people think of Christianity as uh, white so-called Christian nationalism. Um, could you give us a little bit of, of background in, in how it got to this, kind of when that started? I know we think often of uh, the Reagan era, but would you place it there or where would you place sort of the beginning of, of the crisis we're in today? You know, uh, religious historians, and there have been some excellent works, uh, will, will, will trace this back far further. I mean, they'll, they'll trace it right back to the conflict over the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and what to say or not say about slavery. And they will, they will find roots of white Christian nationalism right there and then traced on uh, through our history. Um, but I think in the modern era, Ariel, um, you saw uh, evidence of this uh, and in, in part of our history that we, uh, at least I'll just say for myself, as white Christian Protestants uh, generally kind of don't even know about 
But in the pre-war time, before World War II, people don't realize what a strong movement there was around white America that was anti-immigrant and anti-semitic. I mean, this, this was filling stadiums in Madison Square Garden. This was a potent political force that was tying the hands of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, and, and, and you could see woven in uh, to uh, religious language even then, the strong sentiments of uh, to be a nation means to be white and Christian. Now you take that further after the war, uh, as, um, a, as we entered into this period where there was <clears throat> this divide within Christianity between what became liberal mainline Protestant and then fundamentalism, evangelicalism, uh, the rise of the modern evangelical movement uh, came at a time when there was a, a, a desire to kind of reclaim the best of America having now conquered in World War II. And that got, that got frequently focused in visions of the nation as being under God, as being truly Christian. And the clear subtext of that was white. And that came out as you saw uh, the moral majority begin to develop. People think that, oh, you know, the moral majority was, uh, was kind of rising out of um, concerns over sexuality and abortion. Well, Randall Balmer, the U.S. Uh, historian, has done a terrific book uh, describing how uh, the, the, the modern religious right really began over the issue of school segregation and the right of Christian schools to remain white. And that was at the heart of how of what we've come to see as the modern um, uh, right wing evangelical movement. So the, I think those are some of the places, Ariel, that people don't commonly think about that that have really fed into uh, what we see today. And then it came to fruition uh, and became more politically uh, uh, volatile and, and powerful. Um, as you got into and, uh, Reagan pregnancy, the Reagan presidency, and then particularly sure. the Bush presidency. This might be kind of an obvious, uh, given what you just spoke about with segregation, but um, why would you, along with segregation, but are there other factors that you would say um, helped Christian nationalism attract such strong support um, in the U.S. Well, um, I think it partly builds on a long tradition of Americans and Christians wanting to believe that they're special, that they are uh, exceptional, from where American exceptionalism comes, uh, and they, that they are particularly chosen by God. And in that, it means they become more valuable than others. The chosenness gets translated in an exclusive way, not in an inclusive way. The same tension, of course, that's within your own faith tradition, Ariel. Um, I, I, so I... I, I think that this other factor really plays into the way in which white Christian nationalism would grow. I, I remember when I was um, working with Mark Hatfield back in the 1970s, and he was a and he was a friend of Billy Graham. And Billy Graham came to uh, Washington. He was doing a crusade. He'd come by and talk in the office. And actually, we we had a really fascinating dialogue around nuclear arms. But, but Senator Hatfield also got to know some of the other members of the Billy Graham team. And one of them was Ted Smith, the pianist. And Smith, he was the only one who was sort of a little more moderate or liberal. And, and I remember him complaining to Mark Hatfield about how all, everyone on the team was wearing these American flags. 
And they were so proud of wearing these American flags. And no one got the contradiction that to be preaching the gospel of Christ and then portraying the American flag might in fact be a, you know, that might be a tension. Instead, they just saw it all as part of the same package. Yeah, absolutely. So, so speaking of this nationalism with the flag, I've been thinking a lot about ever since I started reading uh, from you about this, the role of white Christian Christian nationalism in uh, the war in Ukraine, and I wanted to ask, you know, you you've been in. Um, during your many years at the World Council of Churches, you work closely with, with Orthodox church leaders and denominations. We are now eight months into this so that's a, that's, devastating that's a war. Um, and the Orthodox churches are playing a, a major role. Could you help, help us understand what's going on um, with this? Well, I'll tell you, Ariel, uh, this is one of the most troubling examples today of of how um, Christianity is being manipulated into the service of raw political power, and in this case, violent political power. Uh, What's happening today in Ukraine is that in large part, soldiers who are Orthodox Christians are killing soldiers who are Orthodox Christians. And one way to think about the Ukraine war is to say, this represents a global testimony to the utter failure of Christianity. The message of Christianity has completely failed as Christians kill Christians. Now, particularly you see the way in which Christianity is being so callously manipulated from the Russian side. Uh, You see similar evidence on the Ukraine side, but it's more complex and subtle. But on the Russian side, um, when when I was with the World Council, I had occasion to know and to work with uh, uh, Archbishop Kirill, who is now Metropolitan Kirill, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. And, and Kirill is smart, and he's really a wily politician, and he's known how to kind of keep political power through the old Soviet regime, through Gorbachev, and now with Putin which means he's a pretty skilled politician. Uh, But he has connected with Putin over a religious vision of Russian cultural and political and imperial power that has baptized Putin's whole enterprise as part of the flowering and the drool of what's intended for the Russian Orthodox tradition. And and I think a lot of Americans simply don't understand the depth of that. Um, If if by some miracle, Archbishop, um, now Metropolitan Kirill, withdrew his support from President Putin, I don't think President Putin could survive. That's, That's how important and decisive that relationship is. And... Uh, Putin has been pressed, uh, excuse me, Kirill has been pressed. Uh, I cooperated with uh, my, my colleague and friend Jim Wallace in drafting a letter to him early on of 100 church leaders uh, asking him, and I knew because of relationships I had, I knew it got delivered to him, asking him to reconsider what he was doing in the, in, in, for the sake of the gospel. Um, but he said, He's he's had no occasion to pay serious attempt. The World Council of Churches has tried uh, in dialogue with him and with other uh, uh, leaders uh, from Ukraine to see if a if a dialogue could at least be established. Pope Francis is involved at the present time at doing the same thing. But what's happened is that 
the power of the Russian Orthodox Church and the power of the Russian state have been melded together through an ideology and through a partnership of convenience that's serving both their purposes. And it is, I think, one of the worst distortions of the way in which Christianity is interfacing with political power. Now, you go to the other side and you see the same examples of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church um, uh, you know, blessing their soldiers and, and, and seeking religious sanction from that end. It's a little bit different, though, because Zelensky is such a different kind of political leader compared to Putin, and he doesn't have the same ideology going. But you do see some of the same danger on that side, too. So I hate to put you on the spot of uh, solving this, but if you have recommendations um, in relation to influencing the Orthodox Church, um, what we as, as people of faith um, can do, and whether it's influencing the church or it's influencing parishioners worldwide, um, as you said, reaching to the church may be not a uh, feat that can be accomplished. Yeah, uh, there, the encouraging thing, Ariel, is that there are important voices within orthodoxy um, that have been raising uh, these, these issues in very strong ways. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the best uh, website that, that uh, and, and one could find it by going online, where, where attempts are being made very successfully to have a wide range of Orthodox leaders who are publicly condemning what they see going on in this marriage of supposed orthodoxy and political power. Um, and I, I think that is the way in which any hope of change is likely to come. The plain fact is that I don't think uh, leaders like uh, Metropolitan Kirill are, are, are going to listen carefully to any voices that come from the West. Uh, because part of their whole part of their whole uh, ideology is that it's it's the corrupt secularized West that they're fighting against, and so voices that come from from religious figures in the West are very easily dismissed. It's much more difficult to dismiss voices that come from orthodoxy, um, and so I think the single most important thing in terms of having any attempt at at at, at influencing this outlook comes from helping to um, empower, give visibility and be in solidarity with those many Orthodox leaders that are really voicing their own protest. Thank you. That, that though these are dark times, that is a, a bit inspiring, um, that direction. So I wanna move from, well, from one crisis uh, to the next. Um, you've been a, an outspoken voice for decades about for creation care and deep ecological stewardship from a, from a faith perspective. This month, I think just this week, um, we have seen some of the hottest temperatures and, you know, temperatures that are not fit for, um, human life and uh, deaths from those temperatures and an increase in dramatic environmental disasters. Is it too late um, for humanity to respond? And is there a place in that response for uh, people of faith and to use a voice um, of faith for this crisis? Well, uh, to, to answer your first question, uh, I mean, I think the, I think the honest answer is it too late. We, we just don't know. We just don't know. Uh, there certainly are, uh, I mean, one, one can certainly envision the kinds of steps that still could be kept to, uh, keep uh, global temperature rise below 1.5, that the limit that's been set by COP and by the international community. I mean, that's not impossible. 
but it takes enormous and continuing political will uh, to do that. Um, but I think your second question, Ariel, is the most important. Um, it's not a matter of whether there's any room for voices of people of faith. I think it's the voices of people of faith that is essential in the final resolution of this issue. Because at the heart of it all, uh, the climate crisis represents the most dramatic way in which the relationship between humanity and the creator of all that is has been completely disrupted. And, and our, own, our own connection to the creative world has been, has been um, so alienated, uh, particularly from the way in which uh, Western culture and its religious traditions have evolved. Um, it's, it's that culture and it's that economic system and the religious convictions that have treated the created world as an object and have made a separation between uh, humanity and the created world. Um, it, it, it's interesting, Ariel, to note that in, in the Hebrew scriptures, uh, you can't find a word that translates by what we mean when we say nature. When we say nature, we mean that created world out there that's apart from us, that's separate from us. And it's, it's, it's a concept that does not even enter the biblical mind because it only envisions a wholeness, um, a, a wholeness between humanity between the created order and between the creator. Uh, and, and the way in which our, our, our present modern mindset has, has uh, made an object out of nature to be exploited and then reinforced that through a variety of faith traditions uh, is, is really at the heart. And I think if we're not addressing that issue from all our faith perspectives, I mean, we may be able to tinker around and get some pragmatic solutions, produce a little more renewable energy and a little less uh, oil and et cetera. But it's this fundamental change that has to finally take place. And you see how it's happening in all kinds of grassroots places. You see, even within my tradition, the Christian tradition, um, I mean, I'm afraid I can remember it was back when I wrote my first book, uh, uh, the voices expressing concern over environment and creation were nearly absent in the entire Christian community, as well as most of the other religious traditions. Now that picture has completely changed. Uh, but, the, but, the, but the question is whether that change will be deep enough to really change political and economic decisions as a whole. But I think religious voices are are actually indispensable, Ariel. Thank you. I, I, I very much agree um, with the indispensability of religious voices on this. And, and I like your, your thought on, um, on, on, on that indispensableness rather than being just a, a, an addition to the work. So, I wanted to pivot. I know you're a, a supporter of Palestinian rights, and um, this is something that we share. Um, you know, I think I'm on a daily basis spend some time feeling just bothered and upset by the relationship between um, the state of Israel, the, the the Zionist movement and the evangelical uh, white um, Christian nationalist movements. If you could talk a bit about where that comes together, I mean, I would say yeah, obviously in the ugliest, you know, kind of, of places. Um, and if there is an opportunity to address it together. Yeah, thanks. I think there is. And 
it's been, as you say, a long and deep concern of mine. Um, it was, um, it really began when, uh, when Mark Hatfield, Senator Hatfield, uh, made a trip to the Middle East. He, he had he'd been there before uh, as governor of Oregon. He'd visited uh, Jerusalem and knew uh, leading Israeli political figures and so forth. And But he wanted to take this trip and he said to me, uh, I want to go to those refugee camps. Uh, let, let's uh, let's get that arranged. And so he went to Shabla and Shatila. I'm probably mispronouncing them. Um, and I remember when he came back and he said, this issue is never going to be resolved if we don't resolve the grievances that are felt by those who have been left without their homeland, who, who will find themselves in, in these camps. Um, and, and that, that really propelled his own uh, journey. And, and that's when I began to take a, a really much closer look at, uh, at, 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 at the whole situation. I was raised in an evangelical church. You have to understand that I remember going to Bible study classes at night and seeing maps on the board of, of uh, you know, flannel graphs and of what the Bible says here in Daniel and here in Revelation, the founding of the state of Israel, and it all gets wrapped together into an eschatology that 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 sort of makes the state of Israel as the sign of the promise of Christ's return. And it's a, I mean, it's a really, it, it's a really kind of crazy way, but a, a very prevalent way that 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 gained wide traction within parts of the evangelical tradition at the time. Um, and then those in uh, political power in Israel came to realize how they could exploit this uh, faction in political ways to further their own power. And they did so and have done so very aggressively so that the whole rise of evangelical Zionism um, has been an attempt to galvanize that portion of the of of the uh, American religious community into a into a blind support for the state of Israel. Um, now, happily and hopefully, there have been many voices within the evangelical community and beyond who have said this this makes no sense biblically. This makes, I mean, this interpretation is way off base. God is not a real estate agent. Uh, we, we don't find boundaries of states in the modern era defined in documents that were written 3,000 years ago. That's not how we interpret the Bible. Uh, plus, the reality of Christians within a Palestine has increasingly been discovered. Like, oh, this is where our faith began. And in fact, there are those who hold to our faith who are still witnessing and living there. And so there are increasing numbers from the Christian community who, uh, instead of going to Israel and simply going on the agenda that shows them the biblical sites and ends up with them feeling the state of Israel, supporting it is the most important thing I need to do in my Christian witness, there are those who now become more widely acquainted with the real presence of the Christian community and then experience firsthand the ongoing injustice that afflicts the lives of all Palestinians, both those who are citizens of Israel and the majority who live in the occupied territories. Um, uh, so you do see a much a, a growing movement within the churches that's that's really seeking the ways of justice and that's seeking to be biblically faithful in how they approach this really this this really terrible complex issue. Um, my fear, Ariel, is that while this is building, it's still nowhere on the agenda uh, politically, um, and 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 that's what has to change. There has to be a new 
there has to be a new discussion politically around this around this question. And, and there's a desperate need for new leadership, both within the Palestinian community and within the Jewish Israeli community as well. Yeah, absolutely. And this may be part of the reason um, that Israel has been closing its doors so much more to uh, visitors of any of of any political uh, opposition to the status quo there. Um, how would you compare this this time, this crisis of Christian nationalism, this crisis in in, in uh, Israel, Palestine, and uh, the environmental crisis, to to the Vietnam War. You were an undergraduate, and you worked as a, a legislative assistant to Senator Mark Hatfield. Then, and you've often said that that era, that you thought that era would be the most conflictive and polarizing in your lifetime, but that we're now in a time that's that's far more serious and and more critical. Could you compare those and then and at the same time, if you have any um, words of wisdom from from ways that we were successful in that time that might uh, be successful today as we confront this um, Armageddon, this genuine Armageddon? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, during the time of the Vietnam War, it. It, it certainly felt like a highly polarized uh, uh, situation between hawks and doves and, and the way in which uh, these divisions were, they, they just felt like they were so powerful and it was reflected in all kinds of social movements within society as well going on at the same time. First civil rights movement, the women's movement, so, so much else, environmental movement beginning. So it, it did feel to me, highly polarized, but a couple of things were different. One thing is that um, this polarization was nonpartisan. <laughs> I mean, around Vietnam, look, Mark Hatfield was a liberal Republican, which is now an extinct political species. But at but 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 he he was a he was a a, a champion of social justice. He was a champion of uh, economic, uh, you know. I mean, he he would call himself ec economically conservative, and a but a but a real uh, advocate of social justice and a, a fierce advocate for peace. And with him were other Republicans. Uh, when when we did McGovern Hatfield, the major legislation to stop funding for the Vietnam War, I mean, we had we had people like Chuck Percy and Ed Brooke and. Mac Mathias and a whole whole range of Republicans, uh, as well as solid Democrats. And on the other side, uh, there were there were a group of Democrats who were completely hawks, completely supportive of Vietnam, um, and, and and you never got the sense that this was a, you know, that this was a division that was that was defined completely by partisan lines, um, and that's one big difference today. Uh, the way in which stuff has become so polarized and it's been been completely infected uh, by taking over uh, the, 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 the apparatus of our political parties and, and particularly in this case, the Republican Party. Um, and, and that makes the resolution uh, far more difficult, especially when you have what we already talked about earlier, this uh, this reality of of a, of a white Christian nationalism being embedded within a, a version of of uh, the agenda of the Republican Party. The other thing that I see different, and when we extend to other nations, Ariel, I see now uh, the way in which religious nationalisms of various kinds are combined with racial bigotry in order to form a political agenda. That's happened in the United States, but that's my definition, Ariel, of uh, in part of what's happening in Israel. It's my definition of what's happening in Hungary. Uh, you also see it with Modi in, 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 in India. 
I mean, and different religious strains are being used in a same way to put in a, a version of religious uh, superiority in racial terms that then become politically mobilizing forces. Um, I've, I've recently been in uh, Scandinavia and talked with leaders of the Church of Sweden um, and Church of Denmark. And within those societies, they are very troubled by the rise of similar right-wing uh, views that are trying to grab the church as sanctioning their version of what true Swedish identity is or true Danish identity, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the situation we're in now, I think, is far more serious than what uh, I have experienced during the Vietnam years because, because you see now a, a real wedding of, of, a, of, of ideologies that are framed by racial bigotry that are then wedded to nationalism glory and that uh, then oppress and repress others. And in some cases, like in Russia, are even used in extremely violent armed ways. So, oh, good, Ethan. Uh, I was just gonna say, I'm gonna bring my colleague Ethan uh, back on for the Q&A because we're at 15 minutes. And I mean, I, I could go on with my questions for, well, for so long and I hope to um, have you back at some point to have kind of a part two as we try to dig into this more and as FOR, uh, as we continue to build our campaign to reclaim the name of God. Um, Ethan, if you could start us off with a question. We have so many, so I just want to apologize to folks that we are not going to get to all of them. Um, Absolutely. And uh, you won't hear airport background from me, but it is pouring, pouring rain here in Asheville. So hopefully my line won't go down. It's another climate moment. Um, yes, as Ariel said, we do have a lot of really uh Great comments and questions that are showing up in the chat. Please, everyone, keep them coming. We're going to start with this that builds off of the conversation that you've been having, Wes, about kind of the work at local, regional, national uh, levels. Um, John Copenhaver um, asks, how do ecumenical and interfaith groups in towns and cities best resist white Christian nationalism in its local manifestations? For instance, school boards and book bans and Second Amendment advocacy, um, anti-LGBTQ initiatives. We're seeing this all across our country where efforts are happening in local settings uh, where pressures are being made. And so uh, drawing on your work at many levels, can you speak to that in terms of the grassroots work that people are doing, particularly from faith contexts? Yeah, thanks. And thank you very much, John. Um, the most, and, and, and by the way, you're, you're very right in saying so much, uh, so many of these issues now are, uh, are, are really being played out in local areas. I mean, it was Tip, Tip O'Neill used to say all politics is local. And um, in fact, today around many of these issues, you really are seeing how that is true. The, you know, the networks uh, put all the emphasis on the on the dialogue and the, the conversations and debates happening between national figures, but the real, so much of the real action takes place at, at local levels. Um, here's, here's what I could best suggest and what I've seen. Um, it's important that in local settings, you find ways to build a a coalition, I wouldn't say coalition is the wrong word, to, to build a fellowship of those who are various faith leaders. Um, and and uh, I've been most familiar with the ways in which that's been done ecumenically in Christian terms, but also plenty of examples of how that's done in interfaith ways. Now, you build together those relationships, but you don't do it in a, initially in a purely political way. Rather, you have to build faith and trust between those groups. The, the, the thing I've seen that's worked the most effective is that 
like you know you gather a catholic and a baptist and a and a in an evangelical and a and then a muslim and a hindu uh, a, a a a jewish uh, a other you know a variety of faith leaders and you have them sit together and simply have each one tell their faith journey story tell their story of the way in which their faith in God as they understand God has led them to their pre present place. And you take all the time you need to do that. And then you'll be amazed at bonds that are created, at stereotypes that are broken down, because we now begin relating to one another in terms of our real stories instead of through the stereotypes and ideologies that we want to import into our judgment of them. And when that is done, then you're able to say, what is it that we can do together, that we can voice together because of our common concern for the common welfare of our own community? Now, uh, you, you, won't, you won't be able to get all religious voices into that conversation. And, and, and frankly, some of them may want to specifically avoid that conversation. That's okay. But you, if, if you get a wide number, that itself begins to attract people's attention. And then when they begin to speak together around simple issues like book banning, um, uh, it, I mean, it, it then begins to have an impact because because people in the community then realize, well, there are other voices here to be heard. And I think those voices are more powerful when, when to the extent possible, uh, they're allied together. Um, so that's, and, and, if, and, and to, be, to be pragmatic about it, I think that attracts the interest of politicians, attracts the interest of city council members, it attracts the interest of the press, it, it, it's more than just, you know, one rabbi or one pastor sort of getting up and reading the statement. It, it, it creates a more, a more visible and powerful local impact. Thank you. Uh, our audience is really engaged and energized around this theme around Christian nationalism. And we're going to try to get one more question in on that and then speak to uh, your latest book um, before we close uh, at five o'clock Eastern. Um, so I'm going to pick up, uh, we've had a couple of questions um, uh, around the issues of race and Christian nationalism, which you spoke to some earlier, but particularly the um, presence of certain Black Christian leaders um, in the Christian nationalist movement. And as someone who worked with the World Council of Churches and the NCC as well, you, you know well the, the, the efforts by Black denominations, the AME, AME Zion, and so forth, to really be prophetic and speak well, and, and the efforts uh, across the continent of Africa to speak to issues of policy and race. Could you speak from your perspective, um, working particularly with sojourners, about this question about um, why, uh, why are Black Christians drawn, some, bla some Black Christians drawn into this um, movement of, white, uh, of Christian nationalism, um, which is so driven by white uh, racial ideology. Yeah, I mean, it's a complex question, Ethan. Um, and uh, I'm not sure I've got a persuasive answer. There are two things I'd say. One is that uh, as, you know, I'll say myself, as a white Christian, it was my ecumenical experience that showed me how I was carrying stereotypes of what black religious life and leadership was like. It, 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 it took my ecumenical experience to demonstrate the variety and diversity of religious expressions within the black community. And, and, uh, and the fact that you have a, a few voices of, uh, of, of black Americans who are expressing support for causes that are nationalistic simply shows there's a there's a wide diversity but the other thing to remember about that experience when you 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 know you have to distinguish 
between nationalism and 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 uh, Christian nationalism and white Christian nationalism, because you'll find in many voices within the African American tradition the 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 hopes that they place on the nation as being a nation that can truly live up to its deepest ideals. And in that, they see that as part of, of their Christian ideals. Uh, and that strain has always been very powerful. Um, um, it's, it, it's distinguished in a very different strain than the specifically white Christian nationalism. But that, I think, is also a strain that, that is sometimes not recognized by others of us. Thank you. Well, clearly we could we could go on for another hour. Um, there's just more and more comments coming up in the chat as people are engaged. But we want to um, conclude our Q and A portion just to lift up. I mean, you you have written many many books. I'll put into the chat a link to um, the book page on your website so people can access them, um, including your latest book, um, "Without Oars: Casting Off into a Life of Pilgrimage." Uh, you might want to say a little bit about that um, uh, that book, which I know came out a couple of years ago, and I think you're working on another one now that we'd love to hear about what you're working on now. Um, I, th I, I believe you you walked part of the Camino um, de Santiago. My pastor just came back this week <laughs> from, from doing that. Our our new Walter Wink and June Kinner Wink fellow returned two weeks ago from walking the Camino. Oh my gosh! So it's oh. just. So that clearly has a lot of resonance for so many in our fellowship. What, what would you share with us about Without Wars and what you're working on now? Well, thanks very much, Ethan. Um, you know, I, I think th the reason why I wanted to write Without Wars, I, I just believe that um, we don't think our way into faith. We walk our way into faith. And I really believe more and more in embodied expression of of uh, spirituality, and I think that's what we're hungering hungering for. I think, you know, with my own within my own uh, faith community, the Christian community, um, I, I don't think people outside of that community want to hear uh, the message of the gospel. I think they want to see it. I think they want to see whether anyone is really living the way Jesus said, and I think they're longing for for embodied expressions of faith, of, of, of community, of action, of engagement. Um, I mean, I've just finished reading a book that I'm doing a review for about uh, an amazing uh, congregation in New Jersey with its um, engagement with persecuted Indonesian citizens in its midst that just revolutionized the whole situation. And people from the outside have looked at that and said, that, yeah, that, that's the kind of church that 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 attracts me. So pilgrimage, uh, that that's the easiest way to say it, Ethan. We 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 increasingly are looking for ways in which we embody faith and walk our way into faith. And and uh I I just I I think part of the Western tradition has gotten us so riveted onto getting the right answers instead of getting the right practices of how we live and letting the answers come from that. So that that's that, that's sort of what was behind writing without oars. Um uh, and uh and people who have read it uh, that that's what they I mean that's what they like. Uh uh I, I try to give a lot of examples of of different ways in which we do not do that not just you know doing something like the Camino but very practical ways in which we can live in that way. And and uh, just since you mentioned it, what I'm working on now is is, um, is 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 a book that will try to say for all of us who are activists and who are engaged in the life of you know social activism, prophetic witness out of whatever tradition. At this point in my journey, I'm convinced that if we haven't integrated our inner journey well, if we don't. If we don't have an inward journey that's integrated with our outward journey, uh, we're, we're going to be left kind of shooting ourselves in the foot and making a lot of mistakes that are going to harm the outer action and activism that we want. So um, 
I, I partly have been motivated to do that because I've happened to keep a, a journal for the last 50 years. I've read through all of those and I'm now beginning to think, well, there's certain trends that probably apply to a lot of us. Uh, uh, we, we've got to continually learn how we care for our inner lives if we're going to be effective in our outward witness. And I think, I think that's so crucial for us going forward. Well, we're going to close out, I, and I want to, to let you get back to writing, and we would love to have you back on um, when that new book is finished so that we can continue this rich and deep discussion. Um, I think we can uh, download the chat, and we'll send that to you uh, because there are it's a rich conversation going on there. Um, I'm and just seeing, a lot of appreciation. I'm seeing just a few of those, Ariel, including some great links. Tom Getman put a link to a really good site on, on uh, Christian Zionism. And, uh, and, and there's a link to Randall Balmer's book and a lot else. So I, I really appreciate that. I think that'd be useful for all of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, yeah, let's let's stay in touch and keep on this work together. I... I am honored to have you as one of our Walter and June Wink, June Keener Wink uh, fellow advisors um, to, to give our, our fellow Rabbi Mayi um, any support and advice as she navigates uh, the, be the beginning of this next phase of, of her life as an ordained rabbi and, and stepping into uh, prophetic voice and prophetic work. <laughs> Um, and thank you for all of the advice that you give, and I know we'll continue to give uh, to FOR as we build our work to reclaim the name of God, to um, bring some sanity to this war-torn, uh, environmentally destroyed world, and to, I, I really, you know, love what you said, to... Um, walk our faith and to uh, it reminded me myself of I, I most Fridays when I'm not traveling I make challah uh, for Shabbat and that that feeling of kneading the dough um, is, is is as much that act of faith for me as saying the blessings um, it's the it's the doing often that that connects um, me to God and I uh, wish you many blessings on your work and much appreciation for all that you bring to um, creating a better world in God's image. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ariel. I've loved being with you. I see some old friends like Dave Hartzell and John Bellingham and others and delighted to meet new friends. And I'm so inspired by your work that you do, Ariel, with your colleagues and the whole community. Thank you, thank you so much.